hello, I didn't see you there. My name is Abe Hunter, and I'm the founder of The Lead Society, and today, Richard, we have somebody that's very close, near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. Who's joining yes. us today? I mean, as I said in my Facebook blast earlier today, I would say that this guest is very distinguished, and of course I'm biased, because uh, he used to be my teacher when I was in school, but that was 12 years ago, so we have since passed that, and been able to stay in contact all these years and it is the wonderful Dean Southern. And 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 safe and a triple threat Dean Southern. A multiple threat. And th that's a big reason why I wanted Dean on the show um because of the many hats that he has worn throughout his entire career and and um like pursuit as a musician just earlier in the show today, you know, for a lot of us that know Dean that has a background in music going way back. I mean, I, I believe you were, were you a boy soprano? <laughs> I probably was, but I don't think I ever used it. <laughs> <laughs> but like you were always in music, I because you have a yeah. strong tradition in choir and you were a yep. pianist at first before getting into the world of singing, but you've seen it from the stage, you've seen it from behind the director's table, you've seen it from an administrative position, so. From the piano. From the piano, you kind of can do it all. <laughs> it all kind of goes together after a while. When I figured out that it goes together, it was much simpler for me. Good. Dean, where are you? Where are you? Are you in sunny? Um, where are you? What sunny place are you in today? Well, I am right now in Western Illinois, rural Western Illinois, which is um, it's it's quite quiet and, and, and very pleasant here right now. Are there rolling hills? Um, yes, there are actually We're right on a golf course. It's, it's quite <laughs> hilly and, and very pretty. Yeah. And if it's, so like, man -made. if it's like Minnesota, you could still be up there golfing right now. Right. Well, we don't have snow yet. So okay. there have been people out from time to time. Yeah. Well, well life I, in the Midwest. <laughs> right. I, I'm fascinated by your, your background being, um, a pianist and then you're, you were glutton for punishment and, and and then got the voice vocal degree you know what what were you thinking <laughs> well, that's a good question no i'm kidding so i yeah i i always sang but it was always my secondary thing i know i i just you know i my grandfather was a norwegian lutheran pastor you know and so we just sang that's what we did and and i it was a great way to grow up there's lots of activity um you know in the church you know singing and and handbell choirs and um, and I grew up in a small town where there happened to be a, just a fantastic piano teacher. Um, and so I was really lucky to um, have that fostered from a young age. But I remember when I went then to college, um, I should have known that I was going to go into singing. But I, I chose Luther College because I wanted to sing in the choir at Luther. And I remember my first semester, I auditioned for the freshman men's choir. And uh, Weston Noble was actually playing for the auditions. And he said, so you're going to take voice lessons, right? And I said, no. And I didn't. And so then I started playing for my friend's voice lessons. And I thought, oh, this is fun. I want to do this. So then I added uh, voice lessons in my second semester. Excellent. So yeah. connecting the dots between Luther College and then all of a sudden being on faculty at the Cleveland Institute of Music, becoming the executive director for the Art Song Festival based out of the, you know, the Cleveland area, I would say. Um, how did... If you could sum that up, how did that happen? Oh boy. Um, well, I, I, as I was graduating from college, um, you know, my voice had started developing. You know, as, as a as a young male singer, you know, you don't know what you have when you're young. And it was my voice was never anything special when I was in high school. And um, but I, you know, I liked it. And it was, and, the, and my friends were singers, and we had a great time, and we played in band, and we sang, and we we just kind of did all those things, and. It was a small town, so we're able to do lots of things. And um, so when I was graduating from college, I, I had a friend, um, a very good friend, uh, Caroline Wara, a soprano, um, who, who would, had decided she was also a pianist singer and we played for each other and we sang together. And um, she was decided then she was gonna go to graduate school in voice. And I thought about that, but I, I, I wasn't quite ready for that. Um, so I went to, got a master's in piano um, at the University of Missouri with a fabulous teacher, Jane Allen. Um, and I didn't study voice during that time, and I really started to miss it terribly. 
And, you know, and so that it was after that, that I started turning my attentions more to singing. Um, I, I thought I wanted to do musical theater for a brief while. Um, I, I did three productions of Oklahoma as Curly. So I thought, hey, I can move to New York. <laughs> but I got to New York and they all said, you sound like an opera singer. And I thought, oh, no, I can't sound like that. <laughs> and um, but it was really a good time for me. I took lots of dance classes and it, it allowed me just to kind of just explore without any um, without fear. And then I, I eventually decided to go back to school in my late 20s and got a master's in voice. And um, yeah, and that's and that kind of, you know, moved me on to some things. I um, actually Karen Slack and I were apprentices at Santa Fe together. Um, oh, so we had a great Karen. time. Yeah. You know, she's it's so exciting to see what she is doing and has done and um, a tremendous mover and shaker. And it's just it's just really exciting. And but what Santa Fe taught me was that um, I wanted more stability in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was 30. I wasn't I, I wasn't, um, you know, one of the 21 year olds um, at Santa Fe, you know, and so I was a different place in my life. And um, and I never thought that I wanted to teach. Actually, I remember at one point sitting in a voice lesson <laughs> when I was in Missouri and I remember thinking to myself, oh, I would never want to be a voice teacher <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I don't know why I thought that, but I remember I have a very clear memory thinking, Oh, this is tough. And it is tough. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding and which I realize now. Um, so then um, I started teaching at the university of Akron uh, in Ohio. And, um, but I knew that uh, to, to advance, you know, in higher education, I needed a doctorate degree. You know, I had two master's degrees, but you know, two of those don't don't equal a doctorate. And so, um, unless I had you know huge performing experience, which I I didn't, and I and that was okay. Um, but then uh, in two thousand two, uh, Mary Schiller was hired to teach at the Cleveland Institute of Music, and I thought, great, um, I will go there and get my my doctoral degree, and and that's how we got where we are. Excellent, and. Just, you know, for your particular background, what I find so impressive and so um, applicable to being a teacher is this aspect of seeing both sides of not just like the singing condition for a student saying like, I've been a singer, therefore I know what it's like and I can uh, relate to that. But also with your piano background, like I've had several voice instructors who've had more than proficient um, capabilities at the piano. So you're actually able to say from the piano and really support the student. I mean, and this is coming from personal experience, like from our own lessons back in the day, that that was always a very um, encouraging and special uh, aspect to those lessons that you really can be in full control of every aspect. Not that the control is the goal, but just to say that you can fully support, as I said before, the student in the, in their teaching. And I mean, there's even a, a picture, I think, from the end of this past term, if not the beginning of this, uh, this semester, where there were pictures on the CIM website of you teaching on an upright outside for, for social distancing, if I'm correct. That's right. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, again, my mid, tw my twenties were kind of um, an identity crisis. Am I going to be a pianist who sings or am I going to be a singer who plays the piano? To me, they were totally unrelated things. Um, but once I got over that and um, once my family realized I wasn't going off the deep end and giving up, you know, what I had done since childhood is my, my dream and my goal, um, that when it all goes together, that, that, that was a, it seems so simple. I mean, now it seems simple and simplistic, but to me, it was a revelatory thought um, that had never been in my mind. And so, f so in the studio, yeah, I, I think that having the the piano as a tool to convey musical information is really important and helpful. Um, and then to have that stripped away, starting in March when we were only teaching online and um, I couldn't play for my students anymore. Yeah. And, or I couldn't, or, you know, it's not just that I play for them, but we have, you know, at CIM, we have fabulous pianists. So they don't need me to be their accompanist, but I also um, work with the, the student pianists and, you know, 
with the repertoire work with the pianists as, as well as the singers but to have that stripped away in march was um it was very strange i wouldn't call call it um paralyzing but it, it was just something I'd, i had never experienced um and you know i was never one that was an online teacher before any of this happened it just wasn't something i did um, so yeah, so then when we were teaching outside, so we we were able to pivot um, this, well, I guess it's pivot, we had a whole summer, so it was, that's not really a pivot, but we had to, <laughs> we were able to plan um, for for the fall. Um, and, and we did mostly, um, we were hybrid, CIM was hybrid, meaning that all of the classes, the main classes were online, but we did as much teaching and ensemble activity as we could in person. So for voice lessons, um, what Richard was referring to was we had um, outdoor terraces where we were able to have lessons outdoors. Oh, that um, just sounds it was, enchanting. <laughs> it was. It was great. We had these. We have these these nice terrace areas that we never thought of using for for. I mean, because you're outside. What are you going to do? We that's you don't teach outside. No, you just and, eat a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly you know so we were outside with rolling electric keyboards and you know sometimes the university hospitals helicopter would fly over and you know we couldn't hear anything for a couple of seconds and maybe for better um, better or for worse <laughs> <laughs> but it was okay it was okay and in the walls made it feel like you were on a big stage you know it wasn't like being in something as generous as a studio and um, but then inside, um, we, we were really fortunate. Um, our um, director of audio services, Alan Bice, um, devised uh, this low latency studio setup for us. So we had paired studios um, right next door to each other, and they literally drilled through the walls and essentially made a recording studio setup so that um, the student was next door um, with a big TV monitor, um, headphones, but now we're actually going to uh, move to speakers. Um, very nice microphones, and then we, and then I was next door listening to the student through speakers um, with a. I had a monitor on the wall, but also a monitor on the piano, so I I could be looking right at them Ooh. from the piano, and I could sit and I could play for my students again, oh, that's which so I. Cool. Yeah, it was. Um, I came, I, I hadn't been back in Cleveland until the end of July um, from March. I, I, I was here in Illinois during that time and I drove back and I wanted to do a test drive of this technology. And so I called one of my students and she met me at school. She went in one room, I went in the other and we did Schumann. And you know, which it's, there's a lot of give and take in that music. And for the first time in months to sit there and be able to play for my student, leading sometimes, following at other times, it brought back something that I had been missing for, for four months and didn't realize what that means to be able to, to do that. To actually be able to play some agogic accent and it work. Felt like a tremendous gift. And so between the outdoor setting and then these low latency studios, it's, um, it's 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 been pretty good and i mean I, I promise this is not the the lead society roundtable just advocating for cleveland institute of music but it's a great place <laughs> to say i mean i i just so happen to have a degree from there but it was always really cool to see um like you said pivoting to a point where you can make educational and like the academic um realm still accessible even mm -hmm. in a time of the pandemic that you had even resorted to using said like terrace uh, areas for one of your productions in the fall, correct? Right, as we were looking to um, plan what we were gonna do with the opera program, we, we didn't see that we could do a full production. And we, you know, we thought, well, what do we do? We, we, we need to do something, we, we want to do something. And so we, um, we did a, an outdoor uh, scenes program. Um, mm -hmm. It was my colleague, Dina Kuznetsova staged it and um, our vocal coaches, uh, John Simmons and Francois Germain prepared it musically. And it was in October, so that was when weather was starting to change. Um, and that, that got challenging. Um, for opening night, it, we actually handed out hand warmers to the audience. Um, <laughs> it's true. And 
but you know, we, um, they were fully costumed and our costumer went, you know, she presented rigorous protocols to keep people safe. Um, nobody shared anything. Nobody, no two people touched the same prop. Um, the, the cleaning, the, the sanitation, all of the things they did to keep our students safe was, was really remarkable. And it was a challenge for, for Dina staging them because they had to be at least 12 feet apart. We decided that outdoors, that was safe. Um, and she said sometimes she felt like she was um, the police saying, no, 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 you're getting too close, trying to keep them apart. Um, but we could do it, you know, we were able to do it. And I think, yes, I, we don't want this to be a commercial, but I, I've learned through all of this that it helps us to share what each other is doing. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. You know, to, um, I, I, I have some friends and colleagues at other schools that when I said, we're gonna be doing out, outdoor things, they said, oh, we can do this too. And um, so I, the whole low latency came about because I was, um, I know Ian Howell at NEC who was going with the sound jack, getting that platform going. And so I knew, I, I was thinking that's what we would do, but then um, Alan Weiss at CIM was able to come up with a different option. So it's all through the sharing that we're able to come up with these, these options. And I think that's what we need to do is stick together through this. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's helped us to really, I think, feel like a community. Well, I think it's remarkable that um, it, that CAM led the way. I mean, it's it, that there was no waiting around. It's like let's just go and and, and try some of these crazy things. <laughs> well, if we don't adapt, we just stop. Um, you know, I, I I I've I've said this so many times, and I'll say it again. You know, opera as a you know has evolved for four hundred years, and this is an evolution point. And I, I, um, it was great. So that that having the students do these outdoor scenes, you know, always at least twelve feet apart, um, with an occasional hospital helicopter flying overhead. <laughs> um, yes nobody cared you know we we dealt with it you know and then it was raining for some of the rehearsals but it was it was deep it was pretty good for the three performances and we um we subscribed to um, a new platform from um instant encore called live note and it was developed for philadelphia orchestra and that allowed us to have um titles translations on people's phones oh cool yeah, so the this you know the distanced audience you know it was it was a small audience we couldn't have a lot of people, um, but they were on lawn chairs and they were able to get their phones out. We went around before the performance with a QR code, and helped people get set up on their phones and then gave them hand warmers, and um, it was great. It was so much fun and just to feel like we were watching a live performance again uh, was it was it was really rewarding. So I I. Um, you know, being in Santa Barbara with that weather might have been nice. Right. Um, you know, we, we <laughs> you know, like, why can't we be at U, UCSB or something in some place <laughs> with that kind of weather? But um, Midwestern weather, we, we deal with it. Sorry, pardon this interruption. I have to do a take to camera one. That's CIM, folks. <laughs> Ding. Center for innovation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have like a little banner at the bottom. We'll call this number. Hold on. Um, no. <laughs> but again, not to, to to focus too much on um this the institution itself, but your specific work there, like you said, being a part of the voice faculty, but also being part of the the opera theater itself and um really taking charge in some of the productions. And we have a couple of clips uh prepared. And just beforehand, I just want to say that what I always found unique about um, my personal experience at CIM is the collaboration between all the instruments, all the different departments, I guess you could say. So much of the productions um, that I experienced, yes, there is a pit for our hall, but many times we would have the orchestra on stage with us. So you would have these semi-stage productions and um, we have a clip of uh, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges that, um, that you guys did recently. And I won't uh, give anything away, but I love what you did with the staging. You actually made it pop, even though you had limited space. And if there's anything you can, you can prep for that, um, that I haven't said uh, to set up the clip, if you'd like. Oh, thanks. Um, so when I, I, I 
I've been at CIM now since 2012, um, and I was at the University of Miami in Florida before that. And I was, you know, it was a voice and offer position when I was uh, at the Frost School. But when I, then when I came back to CIM, I, I was solely studio voice and taught vocal pad. Um, and uh, in 2018, um, our, our previous opera director and his wife decided they were going to move to California and we needed a new opera director. But at that time, I didn't think that I wanted to be an opera director again. So um, I said, I'll, I can help run it. We can do all that. You know, I thought I'm, I, I'm really comfortable in the studio. So we were working with another, uh, with, with a guest director to bring in to do this double bill of uh, L'Enfant and uh, the Stravinsky Rossignol. And so I was talking with this director. I said, you could do this with the staging. You could do this with the, with the, audit, with the house. Um, the challenge for this is that our, our pit is fairly small, but the orchestra is huge for both the Stravinsky and the Ravel. So we could not squish all those people in the pit. So it became apparent that we had to have the, the orchestra on the stage. Um, but then we decided to, we would then move the stage out into the house and onto the lip of the stage. And, and we used um, the hall, uh, Kulas Hall where we perform has all white walls and a white ceiling. So we use that as a big projection screen. Um, we, we put a scrim down in front of the orchestra which is used for projections. Um, so the orchestra is actually behind the singers. We had monitors out in the house, video monitors. And we actually had some platforms actually uh, also built That's and great. put out in the house. So we moved it um, into the audience and try to make it as immersive as possible. Fabulous. Well, without further ado.
What a, <clears throat> an imaginative production. And I just have to say first that um, it brought back some memories of my French teacher trying to teach me the French numbers, um, which still <laughs> horrifies me. But, uh, but I understood. Soixante set and... Yeah, we've seven. all been there. So. <laughs> well, and you know what, Abe, like in that particular production, they wanted, I'm sure they wanted to make sure that everyone knew that even if you didn't know the word for it that the singer that was there she was a squirrel <laughs> mostly because it's too hard to say in french anyway exactly. and cafe is like quite a hard word to get out even if you're singing it anyway dean <laughs> i just loved it so i just have two quick questions and then richard can take over so what is the area where she was standing by the organ is that like a soloist balcony for something it's it's an organ loft that's so cool Yep, when they do productions right of the, the right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that's in our future. But <laughs> I just love it. Okay, Richard, that, those are my questions. Thank you. <laughs> no, and for Abe, like the Kulas Hall is multifaceted. There's there's many um, many possibilities for it. I and just thought, what, what a I've, fabulous space. And what I found impressive over over the years um, is seeing how the productions have actually changed in that particular space, as many institutions do, like utilize it as much as possible. Um, but That's CIM <laughs> folks, <laughs> I might as well just like I'll I'll have to call my mom and be like she has my degree, so I'll have to have her mail it over, and I can put it back here behind me next time. But. Um, as I said before, the multiple hats that, that you wear, Dean, that um, you come on as the administration, as part of the administration for the Art Song Festival that has a long history in Cleveland, but um, has kind of just been all over the place in Ohio, correct? Well, CIM, um, sorry, the Art Song Festival was founded at CIM by George Vassos, who taught at CIM for 50 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 27 of those years, he was head of the voice department. Um, so he saw the totality of what singers should have. He was also um, a founding board member of Lyric Opera Cleveland, um, which is no longer in existence, but that was a summer company for many years that would run opposite of Cleveland Opera that would run during what we would call the academic year. Um, and so George founded the Art Song Festival as a way to promote the performance of art song um, as a repertoire and as a valuable uh, component of a singer's portfolio. Um, and that very first year in uh, 1985, his uh, stars were Eli Ameling, Gerard Suzet, and Dalton Baldwin. Um, so he started big. Not too and, shabby. Uh, you know, that's okay. <laughs> right. <And> so <laughs> over the 35 years since then, just countless of the who's who of, of singers and pianists have come to Cleveland to be part of Art Song Festival. Um, and so there's a performance aspect that's part of the mission, but it's also um, a training mission um, to, to foster art song performance in young professionals. So um, in, a, in a typical festival year, which happens every other year, 
um, there will be two star singers and two star pianists that will come and they're what we call our festival artists. So they will come and they will present um, recitals. And then each singer and each of these festival artists pianists will present master classes throughout the week. And the participants in the master classes are 10 singer pianist teams who audition as a team um, and are brought to the festival as a team to participate in these in these master classes. I, I just um, and these are photo. usually um, graduate students at the younger end, but usually they're they're emerging professional singers and pianists. Um, and then the the grand finale of the Art Song Festival week is the sing is are the teams giving their recital on repertoire they've been coaching all week with these um, established professionals. I, while you were speaking, I threw up a photo of the 2018 teams and everyone looks mm. like they were having a great time. Yeah, that was at the end of their concert. Um, and uh, Ana Maria Martinez was one of the festival artists that year and she um, gave her master classes the day before. And so she stayed uh, for the team's recital and she's actually in that picture with the teams. Oh, fabulous. I have a picture of Ana yeah. Maria um, here um, singing on a beautiful stage. And then here she is again. Yeah, that was a really profoundly moving recital. Um, it was all Spanish language repertoire. The first half was was very, uh, some of the standard Spanish language concert repertoire. But then the second half, she um, and Craig Terry, Craig Terry was her pianist, so she you know, had the best mm -hmm. and put together this program, um, really drawing on her on her own heritage. Um, her mother is Puerto Rican and her father was Cuban. So drawing on, on those, uh, those influences and those uh, roots in her own uh, being. And it was after, you know, hurricanes had uh, caused a lot of damage in Puerto Rico. So she was able to draw that experience. And I, it was this incredibly personal and profoundly moving experience that I, I think is what we all need to strive to bring to to audiences um, and, and something that's with really... art song we sorry go ahead oh Abe. I know I'm sorry to interrupt you I was just going to say something that's <clears throat> very um, unique to art song into itself as a right right form. I mean when we present recitals we can you know it's it there's nothing and nothing between us and the audience as singers or pianists and you can construct a program however you want and so I think um, that to me was a a signal of where we should go with art song program recitals. Speaking of just art song in general, um, you and I had talked previously, you had done a project um, in Mixon Hall, the same hall at the, at, in the, as in the pictures that it was showing of um, what I thought to be a really smart way to present larger works to audiences that otherwise would say it's a little too academic. Um, we don't have any examples with us, but you and um, a common uh, colleague that we have, Susan Williams, put on a presentation of the Wolf Italienisches Liederbuch. And as you and I were talking that you were able to tie in historical aspects, like, like letters that they had written, been able to give uh, pictures of, of like the actual locale that these people were at and, I, could you speak to the kind of the ingenuity that art song is capable of and how it can present to audiences? Sure. I, um, what I love about it is that it is so malleable. Um, it, 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 opera is also, but that has a few more expectations, I guess, of what we, um, assume will be part of a, a, a process. But but I, I what I love about Art Song is it strips it down to a, a really minimalist um, forces. And so what we did with this um, Wolf project was, um, so I, 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 will, I will say that for a long time as a, as a trained singer and pianist, I had a guilty secret and that was that I didn't love Wolf. Um, and I thought, <laughs> oh my right. God. And I, I kept this to myself. I will come alone. clean okay. too, I'll come clean. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Well, but so I have this. Um, so my friend, uh, Susan Williams, who uh, is a fabulous soprano, and um, she's a, and a wonderful teacher. She's on the faculty at the University of Alabama. Um, we, we've, we've gotten our master's and doctorates together, and we taught at Miami together. So that's a lot of really important times in our lives. And, and I played for her. I played for her uh, 
master's society play for one of her doctoral recitals. Um, just somebody I just adore and artistically and personally. And I always knew that that this was that the Italian Institute book was something that we should do together at some time, but I could never commit to it. <laughs> <laughs> And um, at, the, that, at that time, I was teaching in the summers at Ames and Graz in Austria. So I was in Wolfland. And um, so I decided I was going to do some research and try to learn a little bit more. And I read um, one of Susan Ewens's writings. Oh, one where of she... our dear friends. And she's on and... our advisory board, Susan Ewens. Yeah. yeah. She's as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yes. Um, but I was reading about the Italian Cicero book and one of her footnotes supposed that um, these songs could be a working out of the relationship Wolf was having with Melanie Kirchert, who was the wife of his patron. Scandal. So I thought, oh, this <laughs> oh is getting God. interesting. So that there is this, um, that, uh, that the, the male voice is usually the one that's expressing longing and desire where the female voice is usually belittling and teasing. And, and I thought, well, let's find out more about this. So what we did was we presented the songs from the Italian Italian Leader book in a semi-staged performance um, that incorporated the, the letters that Wolf wrote to Melanie. Um, she burned all the most scandalous ones, but you can read between the lines. <laughs> and, um, and I did. And uh, so we used we used the letters. We used um, some of his early piano works that uh, that to as to link um, some of these things together and to give us also just to give us a break. And um, and I spent the summer um, before that in Austria going around to Wolf sites um, outside of Vienna where he wrote the songs, um, the, the 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 Abbey where he was a where he was sent away to boarding school and would play organ in the chapel. Um, we went down to his birth house, which is now in Slovenia. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian empire at the time. And we went um, to the, the Zaltzkammergut Lake region um, to the, one of the lakes where he tried to commit suicide by drowning himself. But he, but the Kirkerts had a house on that lake and he would go visit them. And, and it was just, Immersing myself in Wolf helped me to understand him. Um, I'm not sure we would have gotten along very well. Um, I think <laughs> he was really complicated. Um, but he also has the most beautiful tombstone in the, the Central Cemetery in Vienna. He's right behind Beethoven. Um, but it is one of the most passionate, beautiful, expressive um, tombstones I've ever seen. The, the, in the center of it's his 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 bust coming forth out of the granite then to the as you're looking at to the right side there's this tormented figure huh. um that could have been wolf you know he um you know he dealed with he died in a syphilitic paralysis you know he he was dealing with syphilis as many composers were Par for the um, course almost in those days. right you know almost his whole life and um and also had some um you know, maybe um, we might diagnose it, I guess, as bipolar or something, you know, we, who knows what it, they, they weren't able to diagnose that very well then. But then on the left side, there is this intertwined couple um, that looks like they are hiding off in the shadows, which totally made me think that it would be Hugo and Melanie. And mm -hmm. so we presented this as sort of a, you know, a mini drama. We grouped the songs, um, songs of yearning, songs of longing, um, you know, that they're apart as they were in their lives. And then we've kind of put the domestic life together, sort of a play of, you know, fantasy and domestic life that they might have had together. And then the end was sort of a yearning for purity, um, you know, the, to be sanctified. And this is the beauty of art song is that you can create or, or develop those, those narratives or, or whatever it may be. It was fun. It, it was it was really rewarding to draw these threads together. And then through that all, we had the projections of these different sites as acting as a backdrop. And then um, the translations were, were there um, as it would be in an opera. Um, and then we went 75 minutes without a break, which I'm starting to figure is about the perfect length. Yeah. You know, in operas and recitals, that's just about the That's my max, perfect length. 72 minutes. <laughs> Great. We're unanimous. <laughs> Well, and like what, I mean, you think we, we, we talk about this on the show many times of like the, 
the quote unquote academic recital and how many times, especially pre pandemic, everyone was saying like, well, that's great. You, you, you have your schools of thought where, which are saying like, this is the only way you can present a recital. Then you have the more, you know, um, people pushing the envelope saying, let's try new things. Let's, let's try doing a semi stage. Let's try getting a, almost like a, a, you know, like just a tapestry and making up our own narrative. And it really just goes to show that it's like anything goes, you can really do anything as, you know, that can reflect your own artistry that can get a point across. And, you know, as, as long as somebody understands, I hope that, you know, it becomes a success. If not, the entire audience can follow behind you. And I, you and I, Dean, were, were talking before about not just the state of music prior, but like even now, like what we're kind of discovering during the pandemic, what's important, what's essential. Um, you and I, uh, you were telling me about this interview that you looked at with uh, Peter Sellers and just like his thoughts about the art form in general, not just operatic or song, but just like what, what actually is like musical presentation. And you, you, you had some really good takeaways if, um, if you could remember any. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think Peter Sellers is just one of the great thinkers um, in, in the arts today and not just arts, but in just on humanity. And um uh, CIM is adjacent to Case Western Reserve University, and we have a joint music program with them. And on their musicology faculty at Case Western is Susan McClary, who's a MacArthur grant winner. And um, really, she's in her, in her own right, this is brilliant thinker on the connection of society and music and humanity. And but she 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 wrote a book about Peter Sellers, um, the the passions of Peter Sellers that was just finished last year. So she, so Peter came to uh, Cleveland and they did a dialogue. And um, I remember, uh, you know, one of our, one, it was one of our, our voice majors said, asked a question about the opera industry. And he stopped her right there and said, opera is not an industry. He said, you know, opera is, you know, and I thought that is so important because we get so wrapped up in the stuff um that it's in 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 his productions he's able to distill these massive productions that um well and he and he directs at Salzburg a lot you know he's i mean he's all over the place he's he's everywhere but he is able to take whatever it is and bring it down to its barest essence which i think we're going to need that now more than ever um because i that's what has has allowed what we're doing to thrive for for centuries if it was about all this stuff i don't know that it would if it doesn't make people feel anything people aren't going to engage in it and we can't expect people to um so i i we don't none of us knows what life is going to be like post pandemic um but i i feel this Personally, I feel this in my teaching. I see it around us that it, it makes us appreciate things much more simply than we had for a long time. Um, we were, we've, we've been forced to stop, just pause and, and take a look at our priorities and decide what's really important to us. And I, I think this is going to strengthen us all. Um, and it's gonna charge us with, with, with connecting to people more. Um, but it's a, I think it will be better for us in the long run. I think um, the conversation you and I had before, the biggest takeaway I had from that, that you quoted from Peter Sellers was, what can we share? Oh, right, right. This was great. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, he, something that he said that struck me like a, a hammer over the head was um, he said that collaboration is the hot topic of the 21st century. It's about what we can share. And I, I thought that was really exciting. And that was at a time, actually, we were, um, we were in rehearsal for a, a production of Philip Glass and Robert Moran's The Juniper Tree. And we were collaborating with the Cleveland Institute of Art, which is just a few blocks from us, that we, to create a live, uh, live action movie uh, film to go with the stage action. Um, and so it's, it, that just reinforced to me that that's where we need to go. And, um, you know, it's, it's, 
it's much more rewarding. I mean, opera, I mean, what all the things that we're talking about, whether it's art song between a singer and a pianist or putting an opera production together, that's all collaboration. You know, I mean, all the visuals, you know, that you saw in that L'Enfant production, I could have ideas. I can't make those things happen. You know, it's it, it takes, um, it takes having a team around you that you can draw upon and trust and let them take the lead on some pretty important decisions. And, um, and then we work together and uh, it's, it's the collaborative nature of what we do as musicians is I think the greatest reward that I found. And what, uh, go ahead, Abe. Oh, I was just saying, um, Dean, did you just realize you said lead? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mute my audio now. <laughs> we can rewind that and make sure we, we can emphasize that one. But, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I think um, a lot of what I think what we're seeing in the arts in these past nine months, especially in the States, is this idea of like, how do we progress forward? How do you do it? Do you do it the same way that we used to do it? Do you find this way to collaborate together? I mean, for uh, the historians out there, something that I always found fascinating is you look at any given moment in musical history, but just artistic history in general, you look back at the Impressionists, whether it be the painters or the songwriters, um, uh, Faure and Debussy and Ravel, but they were all talking to each other. The artists, the like the the visual artists, the musicians, like uh, you look at the um, the Russian Five. None of them were composers by trade. They all were doctors or physicians. They all had these other aspects to their lives, and they were able to bring it all together. Even further back, you think about the the actual like original classicists, like in in ancient Greece and even before where you had the meeting of the minds in any field, philosophy, history, music, culture was just all together in one place. And, you know, similarly to the, the guests we've had on the show recently, um, I'm thinking of a, a guest we had, Zachary James, and saying he, how he wants to progress in the performance aspect using different mediums, reaching across the divide and saying, why can't this coexist together? Yes, of course, we do have our, you know, the, the base classic of any given discipline. Dance comes from a history in ballet. Uh, singing comes from the history of like, you know, Monteverdi and where can it go now? And I, I feel um, in our conversations uh, on the show and outside the show, Dean, that I'm glad there are people like you out there that are actually helping to progress that and not being afraid to to bring people in together and say it's actually okay to have new ideas and you know even like both you can <laughs> as long as there's a scandal in the in their life somewhere someone can be interested right no <laughs> that's CIM folks <laughs> I'm going to have to like take out a, you know, a sponsorship for them. <laughs> but Dean, I, I, you know, I think that the sharing of ideas and certainly with Zach last week was like, what, what is with these, these uh, things that have been holding us back as, essentially for, for centuries, you know, now's the time. Let's make some decisions and, and do things and, and um, you're doing it, which I love. What makes you, what make, what, what did you, did you just decide today's the day I'm going to make some changes? <laughs> well, I make some changes. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think by nature, I like not change for change, but change when I see another way of doing things. Yeah. Um, I, I think I just kind of operate that way in life. Um, I'll cling to things that are traditional and if I love them and don't think they should be changed, I won't change it. You know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, cling to like, you know, my heritage and I love to go back and visit the old world and all of that. But, um, but it's, it's, it's the new that, that really uh, gets me working. And 
as stated over and over again in the show, your multiple like hats that you wear, your multiple perspectives. What would you say, like, I don't know, I guess like the best way to say is like, what would you advocate toward moving forward? Like still within the pandemic, post pandemic, but just like the, the potential of the, the vocal art form, but just musical art form in general of like collaboration, I guess. What do you want to see in um, in the arts going forward? What do you want to be a part of? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, we have seven more minutes. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I think excellence has to stay at the heart of whatever it is. I mean, I think that's non-negotiable for me. Um, and I think to all of us, you know, that whatever it is has to be at the highest standard. But we, we have such an opportunity to go farther right now to take things. Um, we're actually going to be, we're going to be forced to look at things from a different perspective now. Um, and I, and I hope that we don't go back because we're, we're doing a lot. I mean, it's, it's all of us. It's, 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 I see it all over the place. I see the inventiveness that people are showing and sharing things online. And I'm learning so much from what other people are doing. And um, the things that move me are the things that in some ways are the simplest, but there's a truth right now that I think we're all, all clamoring for. Um, I think there's, if, if, if something feels false, it's, it's pretty easy to sort of dismiss that. I, I think we all are allergic to that right now. And um, that if we can keep working to find this kernel of truth in whatever this is that we are doing, whether it's, um, you know, uh, elite or an opera or um, whatever we choose to do, whatever it is, it, if we can make it something that is meaningful to us in a genuine way, that will make it meaningful to our audiences. And then, and then we can have this back and forth. You know, it's 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 this it's this ebb and flow of, of between the audience and between the performers and performance to performers. And there's a vulnerability that's part of that. Maybe that's what I'm getting at. This vulnerability is, is really at the heart of what we're doing right now. Well, and it's, and it's probably always been there. Well, and I think especially it's it's hard, maybe for some folks, to to it's vulnerable to share ideas sometimes mm. um you know it's pr proprietary information um but in this day and age you know I, I, and I, I, as we t talked about earlier in the episode i think you know it's going to be the sharing of ideas is what's going to make everyone survive mm -hmm. and it's so much more it's so rewarding. much more fun it's so isn't much it? more fun yeah. So I, I just I, I, I'm delighted to see um, people sharing ideas. And I, I if you if anyone's if anyone's questioning sharing ideas, do it because why not? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and look at, you know, what you are doing with this forum to share ideas and to to make them available to to everybody, it's it's huge. I mean, this is this is a watershed moment. We all know this, um, and I really and I don't think we're going to go back just to the way things were. I just don't see that we're going to want that. Um, I hope there'll not. be parts of it that we want that we will. Well, no, there there'll be some you know dirty little secrets that we'll have to you know start keeping again, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, one of my, and, and it's, it sounds like, you know, we're birds of a feather, it's just like, the more the merrier. Let's succeed. Let's all succeed. Mm -hmm. And um, share some of these ideas that allow us to do so. That's CIM, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to put a tracker on this episode and see how many times it was the, that institution was cited. <laughs> Well, it's right. I, I, I've just been, and I've been really grateful to have had um, a teaching life at CIM beyond my student life, you know, which was my student life was a long time ago. And, um, but it's, you know, I feel, you know, I, 
you have to have support around you to do these things. And, and, you know, from, um, from, you know, from the president of the school, you know, through the various levels of administration to my colleagues. I mean, we are the, an incredibly collaborative voice department. You know, we, 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 we choose the repertoire together. We, we do the casting together. Um, you know, everybody, we, we do all this together because nobody feels that we have, you know, exclusive ownership of um, it's not like the information. Territorial you know, wasteland that some some mm -hmm. institutions are prone to. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, in, in, in the size of our school, we have about 350 students total and mm -hmm. about four, 42 to 45 in the voice program. There's not room for that kind of uh, posturing or attitude. It's, it's, it just would be totally antithetical to who we are. And, you know, and, and we're very, we're just two blocks from Severance Hall where Cleveland Orchestra is. And the Cleveland Orchestra has a huge presence in our community and certainly at our school too. And it's, you know, we're, you know, and that is, you know, that or, that orchestra in many ways you know, operates as a chamber ensemble, the way that they can play together. And, and I think that sense of ensemble, it radiates kind of everything we do. And and I, um, I'm, I, I'm really grateful to be part of it. Now, can you, um... What's it like when Richard Olarsaba comes back to campus? Like, do do you like um, half mass flags? Are there like yeah, and there and there are trumpets that line the walkway and okay. play a fanfare. Receptions, Absolutely. multiple um, receptions. I'm sure. No, we're, it's it's amazing what 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 he's done and is doing, and it's it's so in. You know, I remember when when Richard auditioned when he was in high school. And... He was on he was on the panel. He was part of the reason why I went to that school. That's yeah, I, I wasn't oh. teaching. I was finishing up my doctorate then. I wasn't mm -hmm. um, even teaching then. And and I think then when I then I went to Miami for a year. And I, when I, I and I did I teach you when I came back to an interview for the job? I think I did. I think so. Really? It, it was I think a, you were one of my guinea pigs. It was a safe space because it was like I already know who this guy is. Hire him anyway. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it's 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 really exciting, and, we, and we've come to Chicago to see you sing, and um, and it's um, we, he we did um, a series of alumni chats uh, with with to connect our students um, right after everything went online, and Richard was the first one for that, and he was. Um, he, he's just a great representative of, certainly I'm very proud that you're a, uh, a representative of our school, but also of, of, of this field. You know, you really um, represent what we want people to think of when they think of a, a professional musician in, in this world. And um, yeah, we're, we're having Richard back in January online um, for an alumni panel. Um, we're doing a four-day intercession dealing with with wellness um, and and performance optimization, and we're doing an alumni panel on uh, the future of music. So, Richard, tell us what that's going to be, okay? And that's RichardArisaba.com. No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect this to be an, the intervention of like this is your life. <laughs> well, I, I'm, well, I couldn't it's, imagine. It's another... rewarding. It's nice to have this opportunity. I have to say, I couldn't oh, yeah. imagine a, a better person to to speak on that. Um, and the future of, of music. I, I was lucky enough to speak. Uh, I don't know how they must have been really desperate for the, the <laughs> International Collaborative Keyboard Association. But but I got to speak on a panel about about exactly what we're doing here. Um, and uh, I'm honored and <clears throat> surprised to be joined by Richard every week, frankly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll stroke your ego next time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dean, what an absolute amazing! I just we could talk all night, and and next time I'm gonna get Susan on with you. I'm gonna have her gonna ambush you. Yes, that would be great. Um, okay, you everyone heard it. We're gonna do it because that's amazing. <laughs> because uh, Susan Susan is a a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman. And we are so honored to have her on our advisory panel board. And uh, oh my gosh, how fun would that be? Yeah, she, we had her to Cleveland in 2018. Um, she, uh, Roger Vignoles and Chris Arpegardian were doing Shuna Miller in, and she gave a fabulous talk before that. Oof. You know, it's just, she's as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. So. Absolutely. Well, she wrote the book, literally. <laughs> right. 
I have a few of them that I haven't read, and she got mad at me. You don't admit that, Abe. You don't admit it to her. I told her. I'm like, I'm sorry. All right. Enough fun for one night. Um, This is where we get serious. Dean, I'm going to play our theme song, which I'm sure you recognized. Oh, yes. (laughs) And now's the time where we can just give shout outs to whomever we want. And here we go. To all your great students and um, but your legacy, your R- Richard Alarzabas, right here. <laughs> Anyone else? The great CIM, thank you, CIM, for. <laughs> thank we're you, gonna have to, No, we're going to have to make sure they show this at some point. I don't know. Yeah, where was that again? <laughs> right? It's like, when did we say that? <laughs> and, and Dean. Abe, I'll... Abe, to you, I, I think oh. this. I, I love the round table. I think you are doing really important and great work. Thank you. You know, we we actually cut out during when you said that. Can we say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us, everyone, tonight. Dean, have a good evening. Thank you for having me.